Well, okay then, welcome. <laughs> welcome to Poetry on Tuesdays. And uh, th this might be an intimate little meeting at the moment. Uh, there, I think we have some other people going to be joining us as their time allows. And we'll see who gets here. Um, today is, uh, the, this month is February and there's a lot of stuff going on in February. So we tried to make connections between all of these themes. Um, February is Black History Month. Mm -hmm. It's the Lunar New Year. It's Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. And something particularly important for this household, it's Lent. And um, we're gonna be covering mm -hmm. all, all of the above. So there we go. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna start with Mark reading a poem called After the Parade. Now, where's your copy of Yoshi, Roshi? There we go. Thank you. This picture on Roshi was taken by Wa after the <laughs> Chinese New Year Parade. So we have something like, oh God, we've lost count. Um, 24, 25, 26. At least 26. At least 26 <laughs> nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews. So decades ago, we stopped trying to figure out who had birthdays and when to get them cards. Mm -hmm. So we decided to create our own holidays, our own family mm -hmm. holidays. So whenever we could, we would get nieces and nephews in town to celebrate Chinese New Year and or um, the Cherry Blossom Parade in Japantown, which is right near our house. So this picture was taken 28 years ago, I think. <laughs> no, 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 they can't be. Uh, 19 years ago. Uh, he was 11 years old. Colin was is our nephew, and he was visiting from Los, uh, Los Angeles. And we took him to his first Chinese New Year parade, and he's hanging from the Kearney Street sign. So, so anyhow, th uh, did you like this poem because of that, or was this no, just? No, this is just uh, because it was. I was walking through Chinatown after the parade. Oh wow! Well, okay. <laughs> no. So after the parade, let dragons deflate. Their time is done. Bells, drums, and firecrackers may rest safely now. All festivals end. Silks must be folded. The stone gate stays open. All gates will vanish. You are safely home now. The moon will do her duty. You know, we lived in... San Francisco for 20 some odd years before I got around to going to the Chinese New Year Parade. And then it became one of my very favorite things to do. It was just, um, and in light of both the Chinese New Year Parade and tonight is uh, Fat Tuesday, Mardi, Mardi Gras. Gras. We have our little plate of oranges and tangerines and red envelopes and Mardi Gras beads, a confluence of cultures. So, um, and our dear friend, uh, when we, talked about these this confluence today with our dear friend Andy Wong, who I hope is uh, will be able to join us in a bit. Um, I asked her um, for if there were she had any favorite poems for Chinese New Year. And of course she sent me this wonderful poem, a contemporary poem uh, by a friend of hers named Nellie Wong, a well-known uh, Chinese American poet. And I'm going to try to find what she wrote about it because it was just so wonderful. Um, she said, where to God, she said, I've been in conversation with Jing Jing Yang, the Cupertino Poet Laureate to talk about her upcoming Lunar New Year program. Um, but this poem that she suggested by Nellie Wong of The Last Hoison Poets shares both the sizzle of New Year cooking and demonstrated the deep connection and affection that exists between the Chinese American and African American communities that we often don't hear about. So this poem is both for the Lunar New Year and for Mardi Gras. It's called Instrumental Rhythm. And I hope you've already eaten because this poem's gonna make you hungry. <clears throat> Cooking sweet and sour rock cod, playing cool jazz, yeah. Whether tenor saxophone or trumpet, pat the fish dry, sprinkle salt and pepper, and the notes fly, syncopate. 
Pour oil into the wok, get it sizzling. Place the whole cod into the concave body of the wok and let it fry. Messengers of jazz at Birdland. Wedged tomatoes, sliced yellow onions, and green bell peppers collide in unison. Chamber music in wrought iron. Pour white vinegar, about half a cup, mix with granulated sugar, Dizzy Gillespie and Machito, um, Machito embrace in a blow of horns and samba. Dribble cornstarch paste like light rain. Thicken the ensemble, crown the entire body with bubbling sauce. Off with the apron, pour Pinot Grigio. Clash the cymbals, serve the fish on an ice blue platter. Scoop steamed long grain rice into celadon green bowls. Sit down, let chopsticks do the dance, a finale that rocks, that never ends. Like, woo, I can get behind that. <laughs> um, and that is making me hungry. Um, and then I was looking for poems to celebrate uh, Black History Month, and God knows there's a million wonderful uh, black poets out there. A lot of the poems I did not feel comfortable reading because I'm not from that experience and they didn't feel right for me. But I found this wonderful poem by Elizabeth Alexander, um, which is uplifting. It was actually written for President uh, Barack Obama's presidential inauguration. <clears throat> and it just speaks to so many wonderful things. Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise. All about us is noise and bramble, thorn and din, each one of our ancestors on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem, darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum, with cello, boombox, harmonica, voice. A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer considers the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils, begin. We encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider, reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain that many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here who laid the train tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices they would then keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for struggle, praise song for the day, praise song for every hand-lettered sign, the figuring it out at kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself, others by first do no harm or take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love that casts a widening pool of light. Love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun. On the brink, on the brim, on the cusp. Praise song for walking forward in that light. Just thought we'd like something uplifting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> hey, Andy's joined us. Andy, um, uh, were you here for the shout out I gave you? Uh, <laughs> I missed it. Oh no, oh. you you missed. I I read Nellie Wong's poem. Oh, you know what? I couldn't log in. I didn't figure out the room login in time no, but that's okay we were a little late too we had trouble figuring that out <laughs> and norma's here hey norma. norma welcome 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 um so we've hello, uh, hello. as we said we are celebrating a, a multitude of things uh today um you know chinese new year the uh mardi gras the um uh, black history month valentine's day andy i put together a plate 
for you with the red envelope mm -hmm. and the uh, tangerines and the uh, and the Mardi Gras beads. So <laughs> nice. Thank so, you. Okay. So um, so I've read the first two poems. Now I'm gonna have uh, Mark read what uh, what now what which of our celebrations is this celebrating? Well we just uh, you mentioned love a few times there. Uh, <laughs> another uh, uh, February is Valentine's Day. Um, and it would not be uh, a complete reading by me, certainly, if there were not a love poem for her. We just celebrated our 46th Valentine's Day together. <laughs> so, and just to bring it in thematically too, formally, the form, stanza form here is the stanza form of the traditional Cantonese folk songs that were made up and sung in Chinatown uh, in the 19th century. So there. So there, Andy. <laughs> so. <laughs> and this okay. is the why of her for herself. The how of her smile, her singular wear, right now, when imperfect time meets her perfect soul, then her there makes it hold on time. Almost morning through night, she wakes with why in her eyes. Pain as a soft bomb for when comes too late. Poems fall, small psalms, that's what poets owe truth. Early waits, all the now of youth slides from then to when. Her palm unfolds on your why become. I don't deserve this. I guess you better have lipstick on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Enough of the love talk. On with another poem. Okay. It's not how that saying goes. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, this, this is PG rated. Okay. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, another wonderful black poet, uh, Lucille Clifton. Uh, Won't you celebrate with me? I, I just I just found this today, and I just, I, I read some of his her other poems before, mm -hmm. but I really like this one. Um. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day someone has tried to kill me and has failed. And a poem of resilience. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I just really like that. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, they talk about representation, how important it is to see people who represent you. I never saw anybody on TV or in the movies who was tall. <laughs> I never saw tall little girls, and I felt very underrepresented. And I, you know, that's trivial compared to other people's lack of representation, but I didn't know mm -hmm. that you could be a tall woman, be successful or be, or just be. Well, well, yeah. So anyhow, enough of me, it's time for Mark to read. Uh, and this is from his newest book, Mirror Games, yeah, Mirror Games. which uh, is only available, you can buy it online from mm -hmm. uh, Green oh, Apple Books. Books. And James just did that successfully. Yes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this book. Oh, uh, the book is um, uh, all about mirrors. It's a very reflective book. Um, well, it is. <laughs> and it basically came about because I was going through a bunch of poems that I'd published in various magazines and realized I have a lot of mirrors in my poems. And yet he mm -hmm. doesn't spend a lot of time looking in mirrors. So I, 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 I blame that's... Leonard Cohen. I, yeah. You know, yeah. why not? Um, ever since Suzanne held the mirror, you know, it's. it's yeah. Um, so. Anyhow, um, so but a couple of years ago, we were visiting my brother uh, and his, uh, at that time, 14 year old, uh, beautiful daughter, Sophie, asked a question. And she asked, What color are mirrors? And I thought that deserved an answer. So after everybody had gone to bed, I stayed up at the, uh, at the dining room table and I wrote The Colors of Mirrors for Sophie Mitchell. You gotta stay on top of that. 
the colors of mirrors. When you're horizontal, asleep, all mirrors are precisely white. They slyly puck out this or that secret, etching them delicately so they remain secrets. When darkness begins to leave, quiet as a butterfly's breath, they turn almost blue as a flatted note you abandoned on a table, hoping it would stay unread. In full daylight, they disguise themselves as plain silver, tricking you into believing you see only yourself and never notice that you're blind. Come sunset, they sing loud in oranges and violets, always just south of the right key to remind you they're watching you alertly as a bent second hand until you tread softly sock upstairs to bed. Then they put on their watchtower faces and perfectly white glasses. They read you all night and they laugh and laugh and laugh. I hope Sophie appreciates that poem. <laughs> I know she does, Matthew does. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay, I see Troy has joined us. Hello, uh, Troy. And I want to, um, Troy sent me some beautiful pictures today. Troy was is a Mardi Gras baby. He was born on Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Uh, Hello, my dear. A few years ago. <laughs> a few years and ago, I'm on. <laughs> That's the best thing ever. <laughs> stories and uh, pictures today of his family who have the, <clears throat> who created the NW, N O M T O C, Nom the Nom New Nom Orleans Talk. Most Talked Of Club. Yeah. But I want to share <laughs> this picture that he sent. Uh, Troy was honored today in a Black History Month celebration. Uh, thank you. For everything that you do, Troy, and thank you thank for you, being sweetheart. here today. We really appreciate it. And, and I think you, you all met Mark. Troy at Mark's uh, book signing on Fillmore Street a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what's your next poem, sweetie? Well, no, this is just gratuitous and has nothing to do with anything, uh, except that you know um, we both really enjoyed watching the Queen's Gambit, um, and I play a lot of chess with with my computer. Because he's never been able to teach me yeah, how to play. And I, and I lose a lot of chess uh, yeah. with my computer. Uh, and this is a sonnet uh, kind of about chess called Grand Mistress. And it has an epigraph. Um, great Charlie Simic, Charles Simic, uh, at one point wrote, I loved the word endgame. She does not play chess, but her body wants to be a Queen's Indian. She loves to say soft. Nimzovich, when trapped in a slow land. She refuses every lover's gambit, even when, once homed, their strict bodies taunt her small pieces. She likes the German words, Zugzwang, that's her favorite. The best she's heard, a forced move under duress. Her talent lies that way. And her talent is moving lies in straight lines and diagonals. She slips off in illegal directions. Her rules rule here. If her knight desires a flight over his pawns and queen, her hand can choose to lift it. No one makes her move her lips. I have to admit, watching the Queen's Gambit made me wish I played chess, but not enough to actually like work at it. <laughs> um, so, one among the various things that go on in February um, is Lent is starting tomorrow. Tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, and Mark found out that St. Dominic's right around the corner from us. Uh, you could go online and make an appointment to go and get your ashes. So he's he'll be there at 8 a.m. tomorrow getting his ashes. So you. You do that even though I know you were raised Catholic, yeah. 12 years of Catholic school, but you're a practicing Buddhist now. You're not a practicing Catholic, but you still commemorate Lent each year. So why don't you tell us about what Lent means to you? Well, part of it is in, there's a term in, in Buddhism, upaya, which is usually translated as skillful means, um, where the Buddha, Buddha matches the teaching to the capability of the person uh, receiving it. and I think part of Upaya is to use what 
what you've got, what your heritage is. And my heritage is uh, the Catholic background. And for many years, I would, uh, uh, for Lent, usually give something up. I would give up drinking until I finally gave up drinking altogether um, at long last. Uh, but also, I had a great nun for three years in a row in, in grade school, Sister William Ann, uh, who kind of took me under her wing. And she also suggested that everybody don't just give something up, but do something positive uh, for Lent too. So each day during Lent, I write a poem. Um, for many years, this was my most productive period. Um, I wrote most of the poems I would write in a year then. Now I'm writing a lot more poems, but I've been unemployed and locked in and, you know. Um, when did you start doing your Lenten poems? I think I think the, uh, the exercises started in 1989. Seems to okay. me the Lenten sonnets were 1987, which weren't a daily thing, but they counted up to Lent. And then it right. was, uh, but so, uh, so it's, you know, a good 30, 30 plus years. Um, but so we'll start with one. And the, so, and most of the poems I've been reading were read Lent. This is from another book of mine, starting from Tu Fu, which are poems in various forms. Again, you can order this from Green Apple Books as well, from Green Apple Books. Um, this is a uh, Villanelle, so it's a tricky form. Yes, he's got showing here, James <laughs> showing his copy. Um, a Villanelle inspired by a letter from Mozart to his father. Yeah, it's, it's called Lean Lent. It's Mozart in 1787. Theaters are closed for the season. Cold rain falls hard outside the city walls. I walk. I keep my coat close. I reason. My facile tunes have ceased to please. On one night, I didn't get it to play at all. And the theaters stay closed through the season. So there's nothing to see. All the teasing sopranos deserted their rooms. The halls are empty. My coat's limp for no reason. It's Lent, I know. I should drop my knees on a prado. I should repent each fall. Still, I'm dull and closed up for the season. So music is all that's left. It's, it's re treason, you know, to suggest a mass ball. Small mistake in this age of reason. People need to dance. They should seize on some way to do it. I'll write another waltz because theaters are closed the whole season. We need some tunes. We don't need a reason. Yeah, you know, that really resonates now at a time when all the theaters and, and concert halls are closed, when we can't go out and hear live music. You don't need a reason. We just we just need that music. We need that performance mm -hmm. again. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I should mention that I was not raised Catholic. I do not have the uh, the discipline of Lent season mm -hmm. uh, built into me every year. I try to give something up or take something on and I fail miserably after about three days. So he's my model of, um, of discipline. Uh, so what, what's next? Actually, first I want a little bit about the Lent process too, just to show you how it gets done. Okay, ready for some artifacts? We've got uh, yeah, artifacts. Uh, artifacts. So what I do is I write a poem every day, longhand. I prepare a notebook first like this. This is from last year. It's covered with quotations. Uh, spiritual and uh, um, and not so spiritual. Um, also a list of the forms I want to try and get I, to. I can't really see that, okay. So he, he, Mark, as, as you all probably know, loves doing uh, formal poetry. And so he keeps track of the various forms that he uses. Oh. Um, and then I'll write the poem longhand in the morning, generally. Um, sometimes I write it again, and these are skeletal remains of the first drafts. The first first drafts. They can't see, sweetie. Okay. <laughs> artifacts, uh, artifacts, artifacts, artifacts. And then at the end of the week, I will type them all up, which will be a, a third rewrite, basically, or a second rewrite. And then um, finally, at the end of Lent, I go over them all again, revise and you know tune up, tune them up, uh, and and then send them out to you guys if you're interested. With any um, luck, he has me proofread them first. Well, then sometimes, yes, if she gets around <laughs> to it. I also carry a pocket version of the notebook. 
for when, especially when I was doing walking tours and things like that, you just need to have it. But because of the being closed down for a year, I didn't use last year's pocket notebook at all. So I'm using the same notebook from last year. <laughs> um, so I got a couple of the first poems, which were written on Ash Wednesday. The, um, the first um, from, 19, from 2015 is a tale of the hands. And I should say for about at least 20 of these years, it's been traditional for a small white teapot that we have had around here um, to appear in the, that first poem. And we have another epigraph, and that's T.S. Eliot's fault, uh, from Wallace Stevens. The palm stands at the edge of space. The white teapot glows like some bleached palm tree that was forgotten here. Once dry leaves is sunk to its shadowed bottom like abandoned palms. My palms gently cup the pot and I let liquid drip dark as wood. On my forehead, a smudge composed of last year's palms. It burns hot as tea. So that's rather typical of the kickoff. Um, but this other Ash Wednesday poem was written while standing in Union Square because I was just, this just cracked me up. There are around Union Square, there's a, you're, you're pretty close to uh, Old St. Mary's. And uh, St. Patrick's. And, and St. Patrick's and Notre Dame uh, de Victoire. So the bunch of Catholic churches around there. So I would get, got to Union Square on Ash Wednesday about noon. Um, and all these Catholics had smudged foreheads wandering around Union Square, and they were all taking selfies, all of them, which I'm sure <laughs> they were sending to their mothers. <laughs> I'm absolutely certain that's why they were doing it. But it just <laughs> made me laugh. <laughs> and so I saw them, and I saw something else there, and it's a little tiny poem called Union Square Diptych. Downtown Catholics snap selfies to prove their ashes, while a long mute poises his fingers to slide a curveball at pigeons. And that's a snapshot. That's a snapshot. That's a snapshot of a moment in time. Yeah. Uh, when I worked in the financial district for many years uh, on Ash Wednesday, I would see at noontime, all the Catholics trudging up Knob Hill to uh, Old St. Mary's to get their ashes at noon and then come trudging back down the hill back to their offices. Um, well, you always love to on Ash Wednesday as you go out, I'll go to the grocery store or something like that. And somebody will tell you, you know, you got something on your, your forehead there. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, well. You know, <laughs> well, when I went to work, you know, people I was guiding, you got something on your forehead. Uh, Okay, so the next poem I think is uh, the confluence of your Catholic, your Catholic background, and your Buddhist practice. Yes, is that? It's is kind that... of trying trying to explain it in a sense. And this is uh, and this in... is from um, Soren Kierkegaard, witness in an execution. James, you have that one, right? Mm -hmm. You have this one, Soren Kierkegaard, witnesses an execution. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, the. That is a person. That is not a statue. That's a person who imitates the statue of Kierkegaard. Uh, it's a living, I guess. Yeah, it's, a, it's a living in Copenhagen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure where. It might be a living in Solvang. I don't know. Yeah, James, uh, but James and Sharon, by the way, are members uh, are the top members of our frequent flyer club. I think mm -hmm. you have all the books at mm -hmm. this point. We'll 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 see. We'll 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 talk about that in a moment. But okay. So this is called. This is called Mahayana Catholic. Okay. Mahayana School of Buddhism. Each morning I sit stone still on a pillow and recite the sutra on loving kindness. Then breathe. Afternoons I sit stick stiff on my cushion and intone the heart of understanding and breathe. At night I lie worm curled, hiding from fears and demons, and retreat to my old mantra, Hail Mary, full of grace. 
then sleep. I like the confluence of the two, the two cultures and rituals. Oh well, yeah. yeah, and when I'm really worried, it's the Hail Mary that gets me out to sleep. Uh, I'll tell you that when, when something's really not on my mind. As a non-Catholic, when we first got together and I started spending time with his family and going to Catholic weddings and funerals and, and confirmations and such, I had to learn the rituals. Uh, that, you know, and it's harder for you because now they keep changing them. Yes. When I was growing up, <laughs> they were the same all the time. <laughs> it's until I learned the Latin for the mass and served one mass in Latin, and then they changed it to English the next week. <laughs> I'm still pissed off about that. Gardner McIntyre's never going to be forgiven for that one. Uh, well, my my first encounter with Catholicism was I must have been five or six years old. My mother used to. Um, uh, work from home. She sewed gowns, not just dresses. She sewed gowns, um, largely for the Portuguese Holy Holy Ghost parades in Santa Clara and some of the other cities. It, it, all up and down California, there are Portuguese Holy Ghost parades, and she sewed the most gorgeous gowns. Our house was filled with these beautiful satin and taffeta gowns, and the capes, the velvet capes with uh, with marabou on them, and um, when I was a little girl, I, I earned pin money by sewing on sequins and hooks and eyes and such. But uh, since we are also part Portuguese, my great great grandparents came from um, from the Azores. Um, we took part in some of the uh, parades, and uh, there's actual footage of my sisters and me in the parades. I was a little girl, and I remember walking in the parade as as one of the mm. handmaidens to the queen. And the parade ended and I couldn't find my parents and I got swept into the church for the mass and the mass went on for like, it felt like all day. It must probably an hour and a half or so. Mm -hmm. But it was in Latin. I was a little kid. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but that was my first brush with Catholicism. Mm -hmm. The good point is after the, after the mass, we all went to the, to the church hall and got to eat soupish, which was mm -hmm. wonderful. So a good part of, of, of being Portuguese. Okay, uh, what else have you got? Oh, we got ourselves an, another, and this is a, a churchy poem um, about, uh, again, trying to continuity. These are the, the stanzas here are the form of the Kennedy's folk song, which, as far as I know, I'm the only person who does it in English, but um, <laughs> but I, I like it. It's um, And this is, takes place at St. Dominic's. I point over that way because you can all tell that St. Dominic's church is about a block. You, you can block see them right from to, our back yeah. deck. Okay. Um, and this is outside St. Dominic's. Technically, this takes place on Good Friday, but you know, it's part of Lent. Frowning at flowers while light fails to fade, she's hiding for now, her damp eyes counting sidewalk cracks behind shades that deduct facts from the holy day's cool hour. She wants church. She's a coward. He wants to see her pass. Blooms cover her face. He can't penetrate real masks or feel God hearing his words when he prays. So he follows birds begging the Lord, and he won't ask for anything. He's late for mass. And I see that we have one more poem lined up. Oh, but first I want to check the chat because I think I saw something in the chat. Okay. Oh, thank you, Troy. I will mm -hmm. I will look into that. Absolutely. And and James, you said you do not have all the all the books. I thought you had all the books. Well, we'll have to take care of that. We'll we'll make sure you get some. Actually, I came across a couple of books that you probably don't have. Um, there was a party. Andy and Norma were at this party, our 10th anniversary party. When we were married for 10 whole years, we thought, you know, we were well on the way to, to history. It's like, oh, we were such beginners, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I put together a book of some of Mark's poems and some other love poems that we liked. Um, you know, just 
photocopied book, but I found some copies of it. And then we did another one for our 20th anniversary, uh, which was a little bit slicker, mm -hmm. but those are artifacts, so I can send you copies. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, wrapping it up. Right, well, wrapping it up, it seemed that um, we're gonna go with uh, uh, Mr. Elliot here. Mm -hmm. Um, is this your copy or mine from that, college? That's my copy. Yeah, we both had this copy in college. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh, Sorry. Norma's got a picture of that day. <laughs> well done, Norma. Well done. <laughs> well, famously in 1930, T.S. Eliot converted to ang what he called Anglo Catholicism because he just could not quite be a Catholic, but he being high church Anglican was okay with him because he was just that kind of guy. And there's still incense. Yeah, yeah. And there's still incense and, and lots right. of it, yes. <laughs> um, but so to document that experience, he wrote a poem called Ash Wednesday, which is what saved him from the fate of the hollow man. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just going to read the very beautiful ending of it. It's a long, multiple, you know, six or eight page poem. I'm not going to read all that. I am just going to read the final stanzas. Ash Wednesday by T.S. Eliot. This is the time of tension between dying and birth, the place of solitude where three dreams cross between blue rocks. But when the voices shaken from the yew tree drift away, let the other yew tree be shaken and reply. Blessed sister, Holy Mother, spirit of the fountain, spirit of the garden, suffer us not to mock ourselves with falsehood. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Even among these rocks, our peace in his will. And even among these rocks, sister, mother, and spirit of the river, spirit of the sea, suffer me not to be separated and let my cry come unto thee. Thus endeth the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you all to unmute and just, we've got a couple minutes. Let's let's chat for a second. Yeah. Um, there's Andy, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sending me Nellie Wong's poem. It was absolutely beautiful. Wow. Um, next month, uh, We'll be back on the third that was lovely. Tuesday of March, yes, which was. happens to be Women's History Month. Yay! And uh, oh. so we'll be fe featuring a lot more poems by women and not a as many as Mar from Mark, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I didn't know to write about them. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Andy, tell us about the work you've been doing with some uh, some women poets. The work that I've been doing, you, you mean with all of you? You? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the poet laureate of uh, of Cupertino, the uh, oh, the women of Poisson. Um. Yes, yes. I've been working on a project with these amazing um, women poets. There's actually a performance coming up. Um, one of them, Jenny Lim, who is uh, just, just a fantastic poet. She is one of the um, people who translated the Angel Island poems for the book Island, um, but she's gonna be performing with Del Sol coming up a program called Words. So if you're interested, look up the Del Sol String Quartet. Um, but we're working on a program that will happen in May with Del Sol. And um, these three women are going to be speaking a dialect of um, Chinese that was probably the first Chinese that was heard when the um, when the pioneers from China came to the United States. So um, with the advent of Mandarin, um, it's, it's a language that's not used so much anymore, but they're writing poetry and reading it in this language. But I was gonna say, it was really fun to do Slow Streets with all of you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. And, I, and thanks for mentioning, because I meant to bring it up. Um, last Saturday, Mark was invited to be the lead off poet I, in kickstands, kick standoff. The kick kickstandoff <laughs> poet in front of Green Apple Books uh, for the first ever ride and roll slow streets art hunt. And people um, went along the slow streets, the streets that are pretty much close to vehicular traffic, 
um, <laughs> from awesome. from Green Apple Books all the way down Lake Street to 23rd to Cabrillo to the Balboa Theater. And all along the way, it was a treasure hunt. There were all these gifts from various local artists, including Andy and her group Arts Ed mm -hmm. for All. There were copies of, of uh, some copies of Mark's books and there were all sorts of other artworks along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a, it was a swell time. It was a beautiful day, That's too. That's fantastic. We got, we got the weather on that day. You know, <laughs> celebrating the neighborhoods, yeah. uh, celebrating the Richmond, yeah. um, celebrating local artists and local uh, local businesses. So we're hope, looking forward to more of those. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark is now one of their, you know, their assigned poets. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. So, I want to give yeah, a shout really out good. to... And I was lucky enough to accompany Mark on the foot trap, the foot part, the foot walk of it. He's, a, I forgot he was a tour guide. He's a, a, a tour guide specialist. And I was in hog heaven <laughs> with his well, the tales tour, the of tour guide is very much evident in uh, his book, Roshi. These are all exactly. books poems about San Francisco, none about the Richmond in specifically. Um, the Richmond is very dear to me. My, uh, I grew up going to visit my grandma at 10th and Geary. And my mother used to live in the Richmond almost 100 years ago. She bought her birth, her uh, wedding cake in 1938 from Schubert's Bakery on Clement. And, <laughs> and then wow. after they got married, they lived on Cabrillo for a while. So uh, the Richmond is very much uh, part, of my, part of my family history. Well, that's nice. That's Joni, you look fantastic, girl, by the way. I love I've, your hair. I've become a Hollywood blonde. I was a brunette when the I pandemic started. And suddenly I'm this and Hollywood smiling, blonde. Though, you I love it too, I'm sure. Not Thank quite you, sure Mark, how that happened. Uh, Troy, could you please talk a little bit since it's a Mardi Gras? I, I just really loved what you sent me about your family history. Just a, just a brief little thing about uh, what, what your family created. Well, my father... In New Orleans? Um, when he was younger, he and his his brother and some friends created a club called the Jug Social Club. It it started in 1951, and it was like seven or so of them. And uh, it's continued on. And in 1969, he developed a parade for New Orleans for Algiers, for the area I grew up in on the West Bank side of New Orleans, uh, for that area. And it's called Nam Talk, New Orleans Most Talked Of Club. <laughs> and the parade rolled in 69 and we had the 50th anniversary last year wow. uh and my niece uh was the queen uh for the ball and for the parade last year so it was really quite phenomenal uh last year it was a great time uh and That's it's always a been a great heritage. time yeah i've yeah. been riding on floats since i was a kid was like five <laughs> years old. no joke <laughs> riding on floats and in costumes all the time and hear me uh, I am, i'm I got sorry your, your mardi gras is so quiet this year but, uh... <laughs> oh honey it's all good it's all good everybody you're all decked That's out all okay. yeah of course you and then i see fun. you were you were cooking a big <laughs> pot of something today right yeah that was a thing of gumbo that was last year but Ooh. i was hoping for that this Ooh. year, that was last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, New Orleans is one of our favorite places. We've been to Jazz Fest twice, and yeah, we just yeah. absolutely love it. Can't wait to get back someday. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a good time, so that's a good thing. So I was love putting it. up the thing for Daybreaker. I was telling you, uh, you were talking about yeah. dancing. If y'all want to yeah. dance, AARP is actually sponsoring the dance party on Saturday. It's called Daybreaker. As, uh, Daybreaker.com, I think you can go to and find Wonderful. it, or it's on Eventbrite. So yes, I need to dance, especially fun. where no one can see me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> they got that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect because my husband just got his AARP card. So he's oh, always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's really what's really depressing mm -hmm. is that the AARP magazine these days is all mm -hmm. like rock and roll stars that we grew up looking up to. <laughs> That makes me feel so old. Just a few years older than us. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of Very crazy. Hip. I love it. <laughs> We're in the now. We're in the now. <laughs> all right, you guys. I'm getting off here. I'm exhausted. You all have okay, a beautiful evening. Okay, I see our, our time is up. Any, anything else before Johnny, we uh, close it down? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mark. Great. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Good to see you all. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next month, if not before. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and go ahead, Choi. <laughs> love the do Joni. it's very foxy love you too bye mark thanks again bye. mark take care bye.